Again, we're running behind, but it's all been worth it. Um, <clears throat> our panel before dinner and before the reception, Global STEM Policy, and we are very, very honored to have Dr. Jake Taylor of the White House OSTP staff with us to moderate. Without further ado, Jake, I'll turn it over to you. So uh, thank you so much, Joanne. And I wanted to take a moment before we dive into things to, uh, to have everyone kind of take their hands, put them up high, and shake them around a little bit, just to just remind yourself that, uh, that you've been in talks and wonderful discussions all day long. And this is the last of those discussions. I do hope that we can have more of a discussion uh, than just a talk. And so with that in mind, we'll have a few questions for the panelists, but after the question, We'll also open up to audience questions. So I encourage you to start thinking for yourselves a little bit, how does education impact the area that I'm concerned in, the areas that I work in, and be ready to think a little bit about what that means to you and how that can relate to the questions that we're going to be addressing. I also want to take a moment to thank Joanne and the CEE for organizing a wonderful event. It's a great opportunity to focus in on education, which is what this is about, and <laughs> on the role excellence will play in education. Before we get into the questions, though, I do want to take a moment to let this amazing panel of RSI alumni introduce themselves. So maybe, Dan, do you want to take it away? Sure. Dan Lee. I'm a professor at Cornell uh, in, in New York City, as well as uh, working as a, uh, in Samsung Research. Uh, my name is Aaron Kesselheim, and I'm uh, RSI 91 and uh, an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and I run a research group called the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law, which is based at Brigham Women's Hospital. And we do, uh, we're the, among the largest, if not the largest, independent research groups in the country focused on pharmaceutical policy issues ranging from drug discovery through FDA approval, um, and then the, related to the pricing and availability and access to pharmaceuticals, and we do a lot of work around uh, drug pricing and uh, cost of pharmaceuticals, especially in other countries around the world as well. Um, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Hi, my name's Greg Gunn, RSI 86 from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I'm a former educational software entrepreneur and I am currently an investor and philanthropist in education and workforce. Uh, I'm Shama Katru, also RSI 1986. I'm a professor of physics at Stanford. I also serve as director of the Institute for Theoretical Physics at Stanford, and currently, through some trick of bad judgment, I'm also chair of the physics department. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you so much for participating today, and, and I'd like to start out by having a moment uh, to discuss a little bit the sort of next decade for your particular topic areas. And, and I would love, if you, if you don't mind, to talk a little bit about some of the major challenges and the breakthroughs that you or the community that you represent is really anticipating and worrying about. So Dan, do you want to start? Sure, my research area is in uh, machine learning, robotics, and computational neuroscience. This is right now, if you've seen all the hype, this is really, really um, an amazing time to be in that field. Um, there's so much interest from companies as well as you know, governments as well as you know, students. So um, the issue right now is just finding professors to teach all the amazing students that want to major in these areas, and that I think is an issue for us. Well, one of the major areas coming up for us is, you know, I, I do a lot of work look, taking big, uh, big uh, uh, data systems, large numbers of claims of, of relating to pharmaceutical use, and then trying to assess uh, issues related to their safety and their, and their costs. Um, and so I think, you know, coming up over the next decade, there's going to be even more and more opportunities and larger and larger data systems, federated data systems that are brought together to try to answer a lot of these questions. Um, and I think that, so that's a, that's a major opportunity in the field, um, but it's also a major challenge because it's really hard to do uh, analyses of those, of those big data sets really well. Um, and there are a lot of ways that you can get uh, tripped up doing it. There are a lot of you know, uh, ways that you can not adjust for confounding and bias in doing those work. And a lot of people who think that they can do this work really well, but don't have the basic training um, and humility that they need uh, in order to try to do this work in a, in a rigorous and, and, and scientific way. And I, so I think that trying to, um, trying to tra train more people and to get more people uh, interested in doing this work, interested in doing it well, and then to try to separate the good, uh, 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 you know, well-done research from the less well-done research is going to be a major challenge. 
as these as these big data sets become larger and larger and become more and more accessible uh, uh, to more people. Thank you. And Greg? Yeah. Um, so in educational innovation, it's uh, our big challenge. You can cut it a lot of different ways, but you know, I think our biggest challenge over the next decade, or the biggest opportunity, is how we bring the just best, most exciting, most effective learning experiences to every child and adult in the world. And with the infrastructures that exist today, there's no reason why that shouldn't happen. It's a grand challenge indeed. Uh, and and Shaman. Well, so I'm gonna, gonna answer this uh, in two different ways. I'm, I'm speaking for all of physics and it's a broad field. So, so one place where I think there are great opportunities is in the study of the very early universe. One of the most basic things that physicists are interested in is the structure and origin of all matter. When I was in graduate school, there was a standing joke about our understanding of cosmology, which was that it's a great field because there's no theory, but there's also no data. And that changed in the intervening 25 years. It's now precision science. There are, you know, there's a seven parameter model that fits the universe beautifully. And because of the generosity of American taxpayers and increasingly taxpayers in Europe and, and, and Japan, we have a suite of experiments that, that look at the sky, that look for very detailed evidence in cosmic microwave background photons, photons that remain from the time when hydrogen atoms first formed, when protons and electrons first bound in the hot early universe, that give us hints about the structure of the universe then. And a whole suite of experiments called CMB stage four in the US or Lightbird in Japan is gonna probe even further back and we may learn about physics at energies astronomically higher than those we can learn about at the LHC. But I wanna give a second answer too, which is probably more in keeping with the technology focus of many of you here and which our, our, our panel um, host probably knows more about than me, which is quantum information science uh, has really come of age in the last decade. You've heard a lot about it. Uh, there are big government initiatives now to fund roughly quantum computing. And I think there's gonna be a tremendously rich interplay between quantum information science and its applications in quantum computing, and also pure theory, whether of the sort that goes into making topological materials that might realize quantum computers, or just interesting interplay of quantum information with other parts of physics. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much, actually. So if, if you don't know, um, I'm actually the Assistant Director for Quantum Information Science at the Offices of Science and Technology Policy. So that, of course, is my main wheelhouse. And um, I obviously think there's a lot of opportunity there. But I think when it comes to the broader uh, STEM education case, it seems like there's a, a, uh, some key challenges that we're all you know, looking towards. And, and I guess I, I'd like to take a moment and, uh, and just talk about those you know, to, in particular, you know, I, I want to understand a little bit. So you've talked about, you know, it's hard to get teachers. I mean, you, you single out professors, but I think many in the audience will recognize that education is, is a broader, it, there's many different aspects and levels of the teaching that have to happen for that machine learning trained awesome person, you know, to make it in, in the door of the company. Um, and, and we talked a little bit about the, the complexities of ever evolving data sets. Um, and we talked a little bit about uh, the challenge of leveraging these tremendous democratizing platforms to being the, bring the, the best, and even what we mean by the best is an interesting question, the best opportunities uh, for learning to the world. Um, and then finally, like, how do we get inspired, right? How do we, how do we drive in on all of the, the fundamental knowledge? Like that, you know, when you look at this thing, you really have to say there's interest that starts early. And, and many here are RSI alumni. Um, you know, I'm not an RSI alumni. I had the pleasure of mentoring an RSI student, uh, which was a very interesting and useful experience as a scientist, and I think it, it worked pretty well. Um, but but you, many of you had the opportunity to come to RSI and to see how interesting science, technological fields, mathematics could be, right? And coming back to how we bring it all, so I'm very curious, maybe, Greg, if you could just dive in a little bit. Like, how do you... How do you see that to develop that interest um, and, and that initial knowledge? You know, what, what are the opportunities there? Where, where can you go? So clarify the, the last part of the question for me mm -hmm. a little bit more. But just that, just that you, so you, you're looking at these software platforms, you're looking at how do we bring the best experience to all. And I'm really curious, you know, what, what you see working in getting the interest in these scientific and, and technological fields. Like how do, you, how do you grab that middle schooler's attention and where, where does your software package you know, play a role? Where, where, where does the teacher play the role? Like, what are the opportunities there? So it, the, uh, I'll answer in a couple of quick pieces, but the, but the real questions about activating science interest, I think I'll, I'll leave to the other folks on this panel. The, but 
some of the, well, first of all, I think the most important platform uh, in, that's emerged for education in, the, in recent years is YouTube. Right, because when you think about all of us, when you think about you know how many of us have you know learned to fix our toilet because of a YouTube video, um, but that that reaches all out to uh, all kinds of people of all ages getting initial exposure to to really interesting domains through through video experiences um, and, and that are often well structured or and much more affordable than you would normally get access to. So I think I think platforms like that that we don't normally think of as educational have been quite important. Uh, another piece is I, I do think we're getting better in the school in our in our school systems and in programs outside of school at, at giving young people exposure to things like tech, like technology uh, design. Uh, we're at a time where it's the idea of building products is sexy, uh, and so everybody kind of wants in on that action. So I think that's been been a big motivator, you know, at least on the engineering and and, and creative uh, sciences side. The, but you know that said, I think there are still there are still real barriers. The, the the step from initial exposure to the opportunity to really dig in and start doing the work with other people, those opportunities are harder to find in some places. Uh, and so the and so I think a lot of the work is, you know, how do you take a kid who gets an initial exposure someplace, right, and isn't necessarily the other the set of other people who want to do that work is not obvious and not nearby. How does that kid get plugged into other people who are doing the work and plugging into the craft of, of whatever domain it is they want to get into? Uh, yeah, no, that that's a that's a great a great challenge. Um, and maybe um, since one of the three of the other you you all had the experience of, of meeting that community, uh, presumably in high school already. Um, and I'm kind of curious, would one of you like to speak to that? Go ahead, Dan. Sure. I, I mean, I think it's it's amazing time that we have all these online resources, as Greg mentioned, with YouTube and kind of online courses. Um, I think one thing, though, that I'm seeing these days that I think um, CE has been trying to address is, is the fact that there are problems for which the answer is not on the internet, right? I mean, I think there's a mentality among students these days that you're going to look it up on Google, or you know, if you're going to build something, just download these things and stick it together, and it'll be all fine. And I think the wonder of research scientists, science is the fact that there are our knowledge is finite, and what you want to work on are things that are outside that knowledge base and really discover something new. And I think that's really the kind of experiences to bring that out in students with teachers and with in, 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 you know, in experiences over the summertime is very important so that they can kind of get that taste of how amazing it is to discover something no one else knows. And that's really, I think, fundamental. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Shannon. I would add just one thing from a slightly different perspective, uh, which is, so because Stanford, like MIT, like Harvard, like a lot of the institutions uh, that are represented here, gets gazillions of applicants, and there's no obvious way to sort them, um, the way that Stanford has, in recent years, started evaluating talent is, is uh, much broader and, and slightly different than what we did traditionally. And so, you know, faculty have nothing to do with that, but the admissions office has started to, to judge drive and potential and, and eventual asymptotics academically in, in ways that, that, you know, that are different from, they were, from what they were in the past and that in particular make the mix of students on campus much more diverse ethnically, geographically, uh, you know, country of origin, gender, in every way that you can imagine. And of course, when you do something like that, you then look at statistics. And something that as faculty we see that makes our life, you know, both richer but also more challenging is that with this more uh, broad-based group of students, there are huge differences in preparation and background. And the most disturbing thing to me is there's a, a absolutely huge correlation between parental income, parental highest degree in college, and performance of children at the level where they've you know, achieved admission to Stanford or MIT or Harvard at that college. And so I actually think you know, one core way that we can improve the quality at the very top is to recruit for more of our population. You know, we're not all gonna have parents who went to Harvard with a PhD and earned $500,000 a year. And, and losing the population that comes from uh, less enriched backgrounds is eventually gonna really cost us. I really, I really do appreciate that. I, I do think that one of those, you know, and we, we talked, there's the, what you can do online, but it is no substitute for integrating into a MELU and, and, and building through. Um, I am also kind of curious, you know, when it comes to an area that's looking at the intersection, as, as yours does, between, yes, the technology, but also like how the regulatory environment plays, how society plays around it. It's like, what do you see 
as, as building that interest and, and what the opportunities are for getting more people engaged in those topics? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a challenge. Um, uh, you know, we, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, people who we see in this, or who might be interested in this area tend to be coming out of medical school. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it would be, I think that right now we're not doing a really good job in many respects teaching medical students about the kinds of, uh, of, of key uh, issues that, and, and topics that they're going to need to know about after they, after they finish medical school and go into residency. Um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of teaching of, uh, of, of pharmacology and pharmaceutical sciences and, you know, prescription drugs are, one, are like are among the major inter interventions that, that physicians make. There isn't a lot of teaching in medical school about statistics, you know, basic statistics and epidemiology and, and the decisions that you make as a, you know, in, in, uh, in, a, in practice and ultimately the decisions that we grapple with in our research group relating to policy and, and you know, how do we you know, how do we, uh, you know, how do you price this drug or price that drug and, you know, what's the right price for it and it would, when is it appropriate to use this medicine or that medicine? A lot of those decisions have to do with trying to understand the research that goes into it and understand the clinical trials that, that were the basis for it. And we're simply not teaching medical students well enough uh, to, to know how to, how to interpret um, the, the data that they're reading in, in the literature. And I, so I, I'm, we're teaching them instead the Krebs cycle for the fifth time. So, um, you know, I think that we need to be doing a better job um, in medical school, uh, you know, training uh, uh, people in areas like, um, like health policy to teach them about the, the medical world that they're going to be in, teach them about biostats and epidemiology, um, interpretation of data so that they can be better, uh, better clinicians and physicians and, and practice evidence-based medicine. That, that really does speak to the need for broad foundation. In, uh, particularly with uh, changing amounts of, of, of data and changing amounts of analysts, analysis of that data as, as machine learning is, uh, is often being used for. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious, so we've been talking a little bit here at the table, but I, I think that there's about uh, 100 really other intelligent minds out there um, who, who have some other things they may want to, to bring into the conversation. Does anyone have a question they'd like to raise that this panel could address? Wonderful. If you could just, whether when you come to the mic, just uh, say your name before you start the, start the question. I'd appreciate that. Hi, my name's Sam, RSI94, frequent questioner. Um, <laughs> I would like to follow up actually on uh, your uh, point, Professor Katru, about uh, in, in, the, in the business world, it's, it's getting to be pretty well accepted that organizations operate better when they have a diverse background and a, and a diverse uh, makeup. Um, for your institutes specifically, uh, all four of you, uh, that are elite and have the, uh, you know, need to have the best of the best uh, attend and the best of the best graduate, how do you temper that with a need to, to draw from larger organizations, you know, l larger pools and support larger pools? I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you embrace some of the um, greater mission without sacrificing the excellence? Uh, it, like maybe like one strategy from each of you or one thing you found that's interesting. I want, I want, every, yeah. I want an answer from all of you, so thank you. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I, I will take that first because I work for the government and, uh, and we have a very diverse workforce in the government. But in my particular field, which is quantum information science, we have a horrible, horrible record of embracing diversity. And, uh, and, and the reality is that you have to make it clear the benefits diversity brings to the individual scientist, to the individual researcher, to the individual hirer. Um, and one of the things that we find really successful is creating a culture of diversity in a small area first and having that spread. So you'll find that a group with a really diverse, uh, uh, one group with many diverse people working within it can be very successful together and that produces an imprint for the future. But it's slow, and it is a lot of walking uphill with water that leaks out of your buckets. So that, that's my, my perspective from the government, where we have, a, a, we don't, we have a, a strong commitment to excellence, as you heard from the Rick over panel uh, yesterday. But at the same time, you know, we understand already we have a broader group coming in, because it, it's not typically focused in as it is in the academic side. But again, that's just the government perspective. Maybe uh, Dan can take it for 
Sure, I can ask, answer that question in the perspective of AI. So in AI, you're building systems or products or services for potentially billions of people around the world. And if your research team or whoever is developing that is very not diverse and just thinking in long one cultural way or one way of thinking, then you might not cover some of the biases that come up in these systems. And we've already seen a number of examples in the last few years about how bias have crept into some of these systems and are poisoning kind of the atmosphere of whether these things are really fair or not. So, so definitely diversity in that, and when you're thinking about building something that's global and worldwide is very important. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, in our research group, we have people with expertise in, in medicine, law, um, epidemiology, ethics, business, and so we try to bring a, a diverse array of, of, uh, ex of backgrounds and expertise to bear on the particular questions, you know, and I think that there isn't, I don't think that it's a, it's a, a zero-sum game that you have, to, you have to trade off one for the other. You know, we just try to look as broadly as possible and send out uh, when we're looking for fellows or whatever else, I mean, we, we send out uh, um, calls for applications as broadly as possible because there are a lot of different uh, people with a lot of different expertise, come from a lot of different backgrounds that can contribute to trying to, um, you know, answer uh, important questions about, about pharmaceutical policy or other, or some of the other topics we deal with. So that, that's kind of how we try to manage it. Yeah, you know, almost all my experience is in, is in, uh, is in product companies and where, you know, for the reasons you said before, diversity matters a lot. So, for, for instance, in my educational technology companies, uh, you know, one day, and, and this was like seven years into running my own company, I realized that we were making products for struggling readers, but everybody in my company had, been, had learned to read just completely effortlessly, right? Uh, we were building kid, products for kids who were struggling in school, but everybody in my company had been good at school, and school had been good <laughs> at them. Right, so you know, and so that's not a simple demographic cut or anything like that. But it was this massive blind spot that our organization had. Uh, so, so one of the, you know, I think one of the things when you're on a team like that, think about diversity in a number of different dimensions. Um, but then thinking about some of the different kinds of things you might want that might be unexpected it means you got to ask a lot more questions. Uh, it means your standard processes of searching through resumes or search firms aren't always going to work. You got to make a lot more calls. You got to do a lot more networking, uh, and and the other thing you got to remember the thing we the thing we know but often forget is that most of our recruiting happens through networks. It happens through our networks. It happens through the networks of the people we hire, and so if you're gonna if you want to reach into a different demographic group or a different experience set, you need to break out of those networks. And as soon as you start hiring people from with, if you hire somebody with some with a different network, that network is all of a sudden available to you. Um, and so that's and so the the last thing I'll say is that diversity in companies it's not something that's it's it's a lot harder to start building it at 50 or 100 people. It's a lot easier to start building it when you're at five or 10, and even better two. Yeah, and Shaman. Yeah, um, I, I can make two small comments. Um, one is to the way actually the question was asked, which I think um, doesn't reflect at all on intention, but the way the question is asked is, uh, given that your drive is for excellence, what do you say about accommodating diversity? Um, that's, a, that's a summary of the question. And to me, I'm, I'm in fields like theoretical physics. Most of my work was in theoretical physics or mathematics, where the questions are far divorced from human experience. Okay, if you want to count curves on a Calabi manifold, well, it doesn't matter whether you grew up playing baseball or basketball. Um, but what's true is that the ways that we evaluate talent um, tend to depend a lot on your history. And so, so the way I would say it isn't so much how do, you, uh, how do you make the two compatible, it's given very diverse backgrounds, how do you judge who's most likely to be excellent at what you're looking for? And, and that's, it's a very different question. It's a question about metrics given that there, there are very different playing fields in different, in different subcultures in America and across the world. And I don't actually have a good answer. But I will give you something from my own experience. Uh, this past year, I took a, a sabbatical in, in the biology department, theoretical biology, where I see real opportunities for physicists because, don't quote me, but biologists don't know any math. And, uh, and one thing that I noticed there, theoretical physics and math, we get um, constantly berated for being the least diverse cultures on campus in terms of students. Biology is, is, um, has solved that problem. Uh, biology groups are 50-50 are by gender, and they have a wide variety of nationalities represented because of the opportunities for studies abroad, and so on and so forth. I spent my sabbatical in a group in evolutionary biology, and I can tell you, and it, this is anecdotal, it's two sample sizes, my own group and this biology group, 
the dynamic in a room of 20 people when there are uh, you know, 50-50 based on gender and a wide variety of nationalities, as opposed to when there are, uh, there are 20 people from relatively uniform background, the dynamics is very different. And theoretical physics and math, which coincidentally have very low diversity, are also cultures where a certain kind of elitism to the level of almost obnoxiousness has been encouraged by our literature. Okay, if you read Feynman's wonderful books, there are two things about them. One is he's hilarious. The other is the humor's always at the expense of someone else. Um, you know, there's a level of obnoxiousness that's almost expected of, of young prodigies in theoretical physics and math. I think that gravitates not just against attracting diverser crowds, it also gravitates against attracting certain people who you'd think would be in the right cohort but just don't want to be around obnoxious people. Can I just say thank you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, the good news is we have a few more questions, actually. So uh, I am happy to take another question from the audience before we move on to our, our kind of the next thing on, on, on my list. Um, if there's someone who has something that, that came to them. Please. Hi, I'm Allison. Um, I'm struggling with how to formulate uh, a question, but I'm very interested in your thoughts. I mean, the YouTube point, I think, starts to get at my question, but it, it's about how to um, get talented people or how to, how to get the, the educator workforce where we need it to be for getting um, students educated in STEM. I mean, people who are um, on the path to become scientists, they have many opportunities in front of them, and becoming a teacher is not necessarily something that they'll be well compensated for or that is um, seen as uh, prestigious or a desirable occupation. Um, and I'm also interested in whether, in your office, for example, you're working to figure out whether anyone has cracked this problem at the state level or in other countries. So that's my question. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm happy to, to uh, take that question uh, you know, from, from my perspective and also to have the rest of the panel come to it, because it, it really connects actually to the question I was going to ask, which is, you know, where, where do you find the best talent and, 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 and how, do you, uh, how do you get that talent engaged? But now the key question you're bringing up is not only where you define the best talent, but how do you provide right pathways for great talent to become great teachers? And so, uh, and I'll speak just to that briefly personally first, because uh, I, while I work for the government, I also am prof I'm a professor and uh, teach classes and, and run a research group and, and uh, have graduate students. And uh, because I work for the government, I actually don't get compensated for my teaching. Right? So I teach for very selfish reasons. I teach because it is an opportunity for me to learn something I didn't know as well as I should have. And it's an opportunity to train others who might one, one day come back to my field, maybe not to me, um, and, and help revolutionize it. So uh, that level of altruism is enabled by having a steady paycheck and a steady job, right? But that being said, I do think it's a real challenge of making certain that teaching opportunities are, are encouraged at, at a variety of stages, right? And, um, and I can't speak to the administration's perspective on that. I do know that it is an area that is under consideration, that we are in the process of putting together the next five-year STEM plan, which should be out very soon. And so I hope to be able to address that in more detail in, in, in a little bit of time. But, um, but I'm kind of curious, each of your experiences, not just with the teachers you've had, but you've worked with many young people, many inspired people. You know, what, what is it that helps them get that knowledge to the generation after them? Go ahead. I, I can say something. In robotics, um, there's been a lot of programs that have sprung up in the uh, recently, you know, trying to get robotics into the curriculum at the junior high, middle school, early as possible. Um, and I think it's a field that, you know, it integrates a lot of different scientific areas and it really is hands-on. And But the issue has been kind of training the teachers to be able to teach the students. And I think um, definitely there needs to be much more in terms of programs to get teachers to re-educate themselves about the latest technology so that they can kind of bring in as early as possible. So that definitely is a concern because, you know, we would develop some curriculum, you know, but then to try to get the middle school teachers to figure out how to teach that curriculum is definitely a big issue. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, uh, so I, I read a little bit of the question to, to, to be about how do we inspire students to want to enter uh, these sorts of fields, uh, including education um, or, or uh, you know, or, or scientific investigation um, that might not be as lucrative as other fields. Um, and I think that, that, you know, trying to inspire students is why CE exists and, and, and what, you know, Joanna's done, uh, Ms. Diaz has done a great job uh, doing in the last 35 years and why we need more, uh, you know, more groups like CE to be, to be kind of trying to give people who have an interest, or students who have an interest in this area, um, a pathway to, to trying to excel. Um, on a teaching point of view, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I, had a similar, I have a similar experience where, I, you know, I teach, um, I teach FDA law at uh, Yale Law School, and I go down there on Mondays, and you know it's not part of my salary. Nobody pays me to do it. I do it because I enjoy doing it, because there is a lot of interest in, in this area among, among students in, in law schools and in medical schools. Um, but I mean, I do, I do feel like there are, there, you know, I, I really enjoy what I do, and, uh, you know, and, and I try to in, you know, inspire that in, in other people to just do what they enjoy doing. And if, you know, it, ultimately, if you get paid a little bit less than if you were in industry, but you have more freedom to actually you know, investigate the ideas and questions that you're most interested in, um, you know, that at the end of the day will make, will make your days much more uh, appealing and fulfilling um, than you know, you know, chasing the the goals of some of some for-profit company uh, at, at at the you know, in, in, in from my point of view at least. So, um, so I think that that's the way you can try to inspire other people to try to in, you know move into these fields, and then and then once they get in there to try to to try to teach and, and to try to encourage those same values in others. The the question that was asked is a is a great and you know, many faceted question. The, the one thing, I'll only make one comment on it. I, I do think, well, I do think we need to uh, seriously work on, uh, you know, opportunities, drawing more people with scientific backgrounds into teaching, uh, better professional development for teachers. I, I do think that K-12 schools are grossly underutilizing the opportunities of distance learning um, to get the best scientific learning experiences in front of their kids. I can only speak from the perspective of, of a university professor, and I'll, I'll echo the, the comments of, of my co-panelists. Uh, kids can tell when somebody teaching them loves what they're talking about, when, when they're immersed in it, when, when they're glad they devoted their life to it, and that definitely pays off in them come up, coming up to you after class and saying, gee, I, I wonder if I could work with you for the summer. And in fact, the normal problem at, at most of these institutions is that there are too many kids who want to do that. Um, you know, I, I would make one other comment, which is, in my discipline and many others, you go to a conference, it sounds like the discipline has gone very far, it's complicated, you need to spend 10 years getting a PhD, and only then will you understand what's going on. Something I like to stress to my kids is, is how very large the veil of ignorance over even very basic questions is in what we do. You know, in physics, which is 400 years old, we've had Newton and Einstein, and how smart are they? But, um, you know, here's a question. Why is space as big as it is? We have absolutely no answer to this question. In fact, it's a deep mystery. And if you can explain to people that despite Newton and Einstein and all this, we don't understand how space is big and we think it should be tiny, well, that's a pretty basic question. You notice space is big when you're a kid. Yeah, yeah please go ahead. Hi, Jim. Fred Chen from uh, RSI 86. I have a question specifically for Dan and Charmette. Um, how do you teach creativity to your graduate students? I take that first. <laughs> uh, that's very difficult. Um, um, I think you just provide the opportunities and just to try to broaden perspectives so that they're not just thinking kind of, you know, this is there's a recipe to solve a problem. I think definitely to broaden the kind of search horizon for them to approach problems from different perspectives so that there might be a, a kind of an interesting or elegant solution somewhere. I think that's what you try to do and maybe show them examples of it, you know, um, you know, how, you know, this was kind of done this way, but suddenly this guy came, this person came in and, and solved it in a different way. This is, this is really, I think, where you inspire them to think outside the box. But, yeah. I totally agree with Dan, and, and I would say I, I do two things. One is, 
I have a bunch of colleagues in theoretical physics at Stanford. They're incredibly creative people, and one thing I love about them is they're all completely different from one another. You give them the same problem, uh, give six of them the same problem, they'll be like the wise men with the elephant. They'll all latch onto different parts, and you talk to them about the problem a week later, you won't even understand they're talking about the same problem. So if I have a student who thinks things have to go one way, and well, you taught us this, and we have to use this technique, you just tell them to go talk to your colleagues, and they'll learn that no, there were six other ways to approach this problem that would lead you to different paths. The other thing I'd say is I'd almost flip it and say, one of the reasons I still take students is I learn creativity from my students. Uh, when I was younger, I kind of thought you're trying to make little copies of yourself, and this was a disaster as an advisor. Uh, and I had a student who I thought was intractably horrible. And what I learned is that his gifts were, were very, very different from whatever mine might be, but, but he had all kinds of gifts that I didn't. And once I understood that, that part of the point was some of these people are creative in their own way, and as an advisor, part of your goal might be to learn from them too, it got a lot easier um, to inspire creativity in my students. Actually, I wanted to follow that up briefly. So looking to the broader platform perspective where you're saying, hey, let's get good tools in. Like, how do you get creativity to the students through those online platforms and, and through software? Do you have any, any comments on that, Greg? No particular comments except getting people, giving kids a chance to do stuff, giving kids a chance to make stuff it's, and letting them start that early and letting that never fall off, right? Just always having chances to make stuff. So, so providing the playground. Yeah, and, yeah. And, I, and, I'm not, and I'm not a believer that everything has to be technology, uh, but, it's, but when that can help. Yeah, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mihir Kambete. I attended the USABO National Finals uh, in 2016 and 2017. Um, I think over the course of the weekend, we've heard uh, a few times at least that uh, CE is sort of seen as a hidden gem of sorts. Uh, and I definitely agree with that because I wasn't even aware of the CE and the USABO until uh, 10th grade of high school. Um, and again, we've, um, on the other side, we've seen CE has enjoyed very um, broad support from all sides of the political spectrum, for example. Um, but one thing I see is that like people who uh, are in schools that maybe where CE is not such a big part of students' life in high school, for example, may not be aware of the opportunities and we, we, we might be losing or we might not be getting to know talent that we might otherwise would have. So I guess a question for everybody, but I guess the moderator in particular would be how to increase, um, say, the awareness or the um, you know, public understanding of CE and um, making the, uh, these programs at least more well-known um, to increase participation in CE's programs, for example. Thank you. So, so thank you so much for asking that question. Um, I, I'll start with that, and, and I'll ask the panelists as well, it's because I actually, like you, didn't know about CE and RSI. In my case, it wasn't until I got to college that I became aware that it existed. Uh, that's a wonderful thing about going to a, a good public high school, but one that wasn't hooked into a particular network. Um, and so that doesn't mean that I didn't get great opportunities to learn about science. So one of the things that we see looking more nationally is that there are many regional opportunities that are very powerful. You know, for me, it was in the New York area, and as you heard from Eric Lander yesterday, they have the, a program at Columbia, the Columbia Science Honors Program. So I participated in that on, on the weekends. And uh, that was my entree to a community of scientists and, and thinkers who thought scientifically or mathematically about problems. Um, and if you look across the nation, there are other such regional foci that exist and opportunities. Now, what we don't have is an easy way to find those things, and speaking to your point, an easy way to connect people who don't have the regional access to the non-regional programs. And I agree that's a very interesting area to make progress on. But I'm also kind of curious, you know, each of you obviously was impacted by uh, your time at RSI in high school. Maybe not, maybe, I, mean, I could speak wrong, but I think you may, were a little bit impacted by it. But, but I'm kind of curious, you know, were there, were there other regional efforts that also got you in the door here in the end? You know, what, what are the other opportunities that, that students should be looking to? I went to high school a really long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like, I, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't, so I, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I have a good, uh, a good way of addressing that question, but, uh, you know, I do think that, uh, I do think it's important for, you know, as many people to know about, uh, about fantastic programs like RSI and CE, uh, you know, because there are, uh, you know there are hidden gems and and, uh, and 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 really talented people in a lot of places and you know the more people who are who are applying the the richer your your ultimately the program will be and I think that's true of 
of the CE programs as well as, as whatever other programs exist um, that the current high school students are, are, encouraged to, uh, are encouraged to consider. The, um, well, see, I mean, CE, RSI was a, was a pretty amazing experience for me and the, I think it was just, it was just because I happened to have a teacher who was aware of it um, was how the, the brochure made it to me. Uh, and we, you know, without that, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it would have happened. The, but it, there's, you know, when I look at when I look at my son's landscape in in New York City, one of the challenges we have there is that the even within the public school system, uh, we have gifted programs where all the good science learning happens. Right, and even at early ages, those are very exclusive. Um, in some cases, kids have to only can get into those through standardized testing, which is known to be a big barrier, particularly for kids of color. Right, so in New York City, an extremely diverse public school system, black and brown kids aren't in the gifted programs or the honors colleges, and so they're not getting connected to these opportunities, even though there are other kids in the school system who are. So. Um, I know that wasn't the main thrust of the question, but it's, but it's actually one of the relevant things. Like that's a place where there's a population that is proximate to access to even knowledge about these opportunities doesn't have it because of structural barriers within the system. And we're about to have some big fights in New York about that. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that uh, the structural barriers are, are really crucial to understand and, and to see you know, how to cross through them where possible. And Shamit, you look like you had a, a comment to add. Sure, sure, I can make a comment that starts with me, but is, is much more broadly applicable. I went to a, a high school that happened to be a magnet school on the University of Illinois campus. And so, you know, one thing that we could do to get broadly exposed ideas is walk a block away and take classes at the University of Illinois in high school. And that sounds very specific to me, but in fact, the U.S. is, is notable for having 3,000 colleges and universities of, of widely diverse, you know, goals and quality, but a lot of them are awfully good. And any of you who've gone through PhD programs know that the quality of all your peers was superb and very few of them ended up teaching at Caltech. So quality of faculty doesn't fall off. There are superbly intelligent faculty in many, many, many reasonably sized towns across the country. And they are actually incentivized to reach out to high school students by, for instance, National Science Foundation grants that tell them they should be reaching out to students in high schools. So if you live in a town that has a reasonable, you know, reasonably sized college or university, chances are there are opportunities there for your kids, and they may just not know about them. Yeah. And I agree with, I think, most of the people here that the CE programs, you know, changed our lives in our kind of a very formative time in high school. For me, you know, I came from a very small town in northern Michigan, and RSI was one of the first times I got a chance to interact with people, thinking about research and science and, and so forth. But I think to spread kind of the message for CE, I think it actually the onus is on us as alumni. I think that, you know, we cannot be passive about our participation in our science so many years ago. I think for the next future generations, we should take it upon ourselves to really say, look, can we go out and recruit or spread kind of the ideas and, and to be able to, to grow the programs? I, uh, thank you. I, I was going to say just that um, it, it is it is a coming back to this, this point of the networks really define a lot of the opportunities that you run into, and uh, and being permissive in a network. Actually, there's a wonderful talk on networks, but I didn't talk about this anyway. Um, <laughs> apologies to the speaker, uh, but you know, being being permissive in networks can make a big difference uh, in, in in how people get the knowledge. Um, I, I am very curious also to see how as our information technology platforms evolve and strengthen uh, you know, how we can leverage that more effectively as well. Um, and I don't, maybe you have another, another point on that. Okay, so, <coughs> so I'm, I'm happy to take another, one more question from the audience, then I have a, another question for the speaker. Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Jiwon, and I went to our side this summer, and my question is, um, can you talk about your project while you were at RSI, <laughs> and um, if, your research projects at RSI impacted what you're doing right now, how it impacted your career? That's a great question. <laughs> I'll Go ahead. Yeah. I'm just really proud that I can remember 30, uh, 32 years ago, or whatever it was. <laughs> uh, I worked with Dr. Mario Cuna at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center on, on measurements of the interplanetary magnetic field. And he made me learn some awful computer language to write some kind of code for him. 
uh, you know, I, I can't say directly how the project itself impacted my trajectory, though I'm, I'm just, by most standards, a tiny stone's throw away from astrophysics and what I do now. Um, but I can speak to something that I think other panelists also started to speak to, which was the broader significance of RSI. And I think something that, that many educators have emphasized is that there's a serious imposter effect or imposter problem in science where, where kids, even very, very gifted kids, may worry about their ability to function in a, in a culture that's portrayed the way science is portrayed in the US. You know, if you're a 15-year-old who's good, there's always that 13-year-old who just won the, the International Math Olympiad, and you're, you're already 15, and you didn't win the International Math Olympiad. What the hell are you doing in math, right? And, and this is a real effect. And I think programs like RSI, for those of us lucky enough to go, have a big effect in telling you, you know, well, you're doing pretty well, and, and there's, you know, you, you might actually be able to do something in, in science or math. And I think that, that bit of the, um, the RSI experience was personally more important to me than the details of the specific research. Great, you wanna give it a shot? So I was, a ma I was kind of a math and computers head, uh, but I wanted to try something in biology. So I got sent out to Patuxent Wildlife Research Center to observe the poisoning of ducks. Um, <laughs> so we, we, we were, it, was, it was a research study about contamination of marshlands and its effect on ducks. So I watched ducks all day and coded their behavior very, very specifically. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and, and in terms of its long-term impact on my career, I, I did not pursue biology further. <laughs> uh, I, worked, uh, I worked with uh, Dr. Lance Liotta at the uh, National Cancer Institute uh, looking at a, uh, trying to isolate a, uh, a protein that cancer cells uh, as, uh, emitted that was, we were in, trying to investigate um, whether or not you could uh, anticipate when cancer was going to metastasize by evaluating the existence of this protein in urine. So instead of duck poop, I looked at a lot of human urine. Um, and, uh, and it was just great. I don't, I don't remember too much about the, what, what we found in our particular experiments, but I do remember one of the very, a very vivid memory from RSI is that on the last day I brought uh, I brought some flowers to the research assistant to thank her for all the mentorship and whatever that she provided over the over the summer. And she put it down on the lab bench and and took a, a razor blade to cut them and cut through them and then cut through a cord that was beneath the flowers and and went zap and like sort of uh, electrocuted herself and flew back a few feet. And that uh, was fine. She did okay, uh, but. Uh, it was that. That is the one. That is of all the things. One thing I very vividly remember: the pop and the way that she flew back. Um, so anyway, how did it influence my career? Well, uh, um, so I went into. I continued. I went into medicine, and I, so, you know, my my research now is is policy, and and you know, is it, uh, but I do, you know, I do and really did enjoy that, and some of the subsequent uh, laboratory-based work that I did, and. Um, uh, you know, I think that it 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 uh, it really was a it really was a great a, a great time and and and, uh, um, and you know a lot of the work that I do now relates to thinking about ultimately the drugs that are developed to try to address those kinds of issues. Um, so I like to think that it's sort of a yin and a yang, um, but uh, but it was great. So I think I'm the oldest one on the panel, so I have to remember you know what that project was. But I actually did my project at David Taylor Naval Research Basin in Carderock, Maryland. Um, and it's, if you don't know, it's a facility for the Navy where they basically did tank testing for all sorts of sub and um, ship designs. So it was very interesting to see kind of just how the Navy actually built things. Um, I did a project on, I think, uh, simulating aerodynamics. And that actually subsequently became my Westinghouse project at the time. So Westinghouse is now called Regeneron, but I, I became a finalist for the Westinghouse. And I think that also influenced me because then you got to go down to Washington DC after RSI and meet a whole bunch of like-minded science kids from that. So I definitely think that that started my trajectory in, in research science. Uh, I didn't go to RSI. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do wanna say one thing about it though, which is a great question that you raised, which is fundamentally, I think one of the benefits of this early education and this type of interest building is giving students an opportunity to find their failures quickly. Right? This fail fast concept, it matters a lot because the choices you make early on help determine how quickly you can get into the thing where you know you can make the big impact. And I, I just think that I encourage you to leverage your knowledge from this last summer to figure that out as quickly as you can. Um, there is another question over here, go ahead. 
needlessly provocative one, but I guess. So, um, you know, like when you go to graduate school, right, like some people take 10 years. Some people take five years. I think Shama took three years, something like that. Are universities too rigid for, for their diversity goals, right? Like we don't admit anyone saying you're a five-year university student or a three-year university student. We say, oh, you're a four-year university student. Well, if we want to take people from backgrounds where there are widely different levels of preparation, does it make any sense to say, here's the cookie cutter, you're a four-year student? I mean, I, I wonder like if some of what we're trying to do, we're, we're, splay, you know, we're deliberately working against it with the university's desire to have so much structure and that everyone is going to graduate in the same amount of time regardless. Uh, it looks like you have a response to that, so yeah. go ahead. Well, not a response. I mean, Steve, I think that's, that's the 100% right question. Because if you're saying we evaluate talent in, in a faulty way, the, this, this other person who might look worse on paper by some standards actually has the intrinsic motivation and capability and interest and, and intelligence to do this and will do it better in the end, but just hasn't had the opportunity. Well, then it, it's incumbent on you to provide them the opportunity to get to the level where they will thrive at the university. And a lot of what we do at the start, something that's very easy to do is fix admissions. And, and now you have all the students there and they're very diverse, but you know, the classes are all the same, and nobody, nobody told you that the percentage of students entering with advanced calculus suddenly went down by 30%. Uh, I, I think it's incumbent on us to either figure out how to do bridge years at our universities in some cases, uh, or have separate programs that will bridge students. Um, but it's a little crazy to pretend that, that um, the intrinsic ability that's evident in somebody's file but that didn't you know, get exposed to the same background knowledge will just allow them to accelerate and make up for that in the same fixed allotted time. Um, and I actually do think that's somewhere we're, we're behind because like I said, it's easy, to, it's easy to fix admissions and it's much harder structurally to convince your faculty to, to teach preparatory courses, to add a year for certain students and convince their, their parents they need an extra year of tuition, mm -hmm. to, to get these elite students who've done the best always to come to, to, to Harvard and say, well, I'm a five-year student. I'm really not ready to be here because that's how they'll feel. It's not true. It's not the right way to view it. Um, and so there are really complicated issues around that. Yeah, and I want to follow. I, I think this is one of those places where workforce education is actually evolving much more quickly than the, than the rest of higher education. Because in, in workforce, for a wide, wide variety of careers, people are rethinking professional programs and saying, like, look, let's give people credit for where they started out, and let's be very clear about what we're trying to get them to. Um, for you know, for purposes of efficiency, but for purposes of affordability and time savings, uh, the opportunity cost of higher education and professional education is extraordinary now. Uh, in addition to the fact that the dollar cost is very high, so you know, so, so the same personalization problem that you know you're coming at from that angle, it's the, the affordability angle is driving it just as hard, and uh, and so we're but we're seeing. We're seeing professional education organizations outside of colleges and universities evolving quite quickly on this front. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think it's a really good point. I think we do it to a certain extent. I remember when I was in college, Harvard had a, an opportunity where people could fast track and finish in three years. And I felt so sad for those people because college is so much fun. And why would you only want to do it in three years? But there are maybe, you know, people have their own reasons for wanting to do that. And then there are people who, Money. you know, What's that? Yeah, who <laughs> find their way to who find their way to do it in five years because they have you know they want to take an, a year and do it in, in and do a year in Japan or something like that. So I think I just think what we need is more is better advising so that we we in, you direct people to find the right things and to in order to figure out where they actually should be instead of just following the default because it's the easiest thing. But actually, and, and trying to better direct individuals to the to the right pathway for them. And, and, and then if we need more pathways, then we need to develop those. And I agree with you. I think that there's too much hysteresis in our educational system. Um, just we do things because, you know, that's the way it's been done, not just in terms of length of the time, but also to departments, you know, what are the fund uh, introductory courses, right? These are all the issues. And I mean, I think we should think, rethink things. And I think, you know, alternative ways of doing things is, is what we should be open to. I want to respond to that also just a little bit, because if you look outside at the very top institutions, and you look at the transfer rates, and you look at the role community colleges play in preparing students, uh, there's been a tremendous increase in uh, the fluidity between institutions. So students have wised up to the space that you just described. Uh, whether the institutions follow is an interesting open question. 
Um, I, I think we're getting very close to the end of our time. So I just want, well, I, I mean, I, I am tracking relative yes, to a, that was, that was to some time zone. Um, and I just sense from the audience. Yeah, that yeah. I, I just want uh, uh, to take a moment um, and, and uh, you know, to really just ask you for a moment to think to the next generation, the, the, the student who might be watching on Facebook right now, uh, uh, who is maybe in middle school saying, what is all the science thing about? You know, what is the advice that you're going to give to them? Uh, and, and make it succinct if you can, because they have to remember it. I mean, I just think you should, you know, never take anything for granted. I mean, the thing to really do is what we heard here is, you know, ask yourself why, ask yourself the fundamental questions, seek the truth, and I think that's the way you really discover things. Yeah, I would tell that student to turn off Facebook and, and go outside. <laughs> uh, and uh, just follow, you know, do what you do, what you do, what, do, what, do what you really love, and, uh, and everything else will follow. Um, express yourself, have fun, make money, save the world. <laughs> In that order. Any of them. Okay. I think I would just say broaden much more than you think you should. Okay. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you all very much for your input. Let's give the hand to the panelists.